I hope you all remember that wonderful introduction. <laughs> and I can resolve another problem for you um, about what is climatology and what is climate science. I was asked to speak to a grade four class who are studying uh, the fur trade. And of course, the weather during the fur trade of the Little Ice Age was a very important issue. And the teacher introduced me as a climatologist. And immediately a hand went up at the back of the room. And I said, yes, you got a question? He said, yes, how many mountains have you climbed anyway? Twenty-five percent of the American population still thinks that the sun goes around the earth and it doesn't matter to them. It's of no consequence. And this is a very important part of the whole debate here because for the majority of the public, science is of no direct consequence whatsoever, particularly scientific theories and, and uh, research and so on. And so, um, when Copernicus uh, became so politically involved because of what he said, um, and that came out, say the, the most of the 25 percent of the American public still don't know that, and they say it's of no consequence. When Newton said there was gravity, people said, as long as I don't fall off, I don't care. They still can't tell you what, what Newton was all about, and they're not aware that Newton started as a theory and ended up as a law because they had a conference at which they said, it's been a theory long, long enough, we'll make it a law. See, that, that's the kind of thinking that goes on. And Einstein, most scientists still can't tell you what Einstein said. So when you start to look at the great scientists of history that had, have had an impact, the impact is in a very vague way. It's in the history books. It's who somebody after the fact have decided. It's like when you go and read Kepler and his three planetary motions comments are separated by pages and pages of other uh, information. It was only later somebody came and put them all together and gave Kepler the uh, recommendation for it. But things changed when Darwin came along because to put it very simplistically, Darwin said your grandfather's a gorilla. Now he's talking about everybody. Now everybody is directly and emotionally involved in science. And of course, we saw the politics of Darwin and Herbert Spencer's comments about survival of the fittest and so on. So there was a, a very significant change. And I think it's important to point out that even today, the discussion about Darwin with Richard Dawkins and so on is very much an integral part of this whole debate that's going on. And, of course, that also ties into a question that was asked uh, earlier about religion. Because once you effectively get rid of God, then you've got to find some other justification for humans being different than all the other animals. And what happened in the academ academic world was we went from two faculties, which were the uh, natural sciences and the humanities, to today where the largest faculties on campus are the social sciences. And the social sciences are what I call human navel-gazing. It's, it's attempting to explain why humans are different, superior to all the other animals. And there's another whole story of that, uh, but, but, but we'll leave it at that point. Next uh, slide. I was asked to uh, a, a group of uh, engineers, hydrologists, and so on, um, in Calgary, Alberta, wanted to set up a, a group to oppose the Kyoto Protocol from a science perspective. Um, of course, they had a huge problem because they were from Calgary and from Alberta. And uh, so they were Im immediately suspect, plus a lot of them had worked in the oil patch. But they looked at the science behind the Kyoto Protocol. The debate wasn't that they didn't want to set up the society. The debate was how much of their attention should be on the science and how much on the politics. They chose to go 100% with the science. That was a deliberate discussion and, and choice. The problem is they got very quickly undermined by the politics. Because unbeknownst to them, the person that was getting funding for them got $12,000 from an oil company. 
And when that went out, it didn't matter what they said scientifically, they were dead, absolutely dead in the water. And of course, that's the interesting issue, and Patrick Michaels talked to that. By the way, one of the best arguments that I've heard about the funding is that it doesn't matter who pays you, if your science doesn't hold up, it doesn't matter. That's the real test. It's not who funded it. Yes, there's going to be bias with that, but the real test is in the results. Next slide. This is a, a, a graph of the number of students up to the age of 15 in high schools across the world that are, have uh, scientific skills. You see that all of them are less than 20%. And that's a very, very important part of this whole debate. See, because I taught a science credit for art students. And I knew that if I went into the first class and put a formula on the board, 60% wouldn't be at the second lecture, okay? And the sad part is, not only are they not scientifically, or scientifically minded, but they're proud about the fact that they can't handle numbers. There's almost a pride in that. And so when you start to talk about climate and climate science and say, oh, well, we've got to pursue the science and show the science is wrong, it's going by choice over the head of 80% of the population. And then if you look at uh, the next uh, part, here's, here's the number of graduates um, in, in science and engineering and so on. And you see that even the highest one is still only 30%. So the percentages of students in the, in the academic world indicate this bias of arts and science. Next slide. This is a law faculty at, at uh, Michigan, and of course one of the problems I had with my lawsuits was to find a lawyer that could understand the science. All right? And I, played, I, I had some experience because I knew from my own students that went on to law school that most lawyers fail taxation in second year because it's numbers, okay? And so I said to him, how, do you, how well did you do in taxation? And he said, I was top of the class, I loved it. I said, good, you're my lawyer, right? And it turned out that with his abilities in logic as well as the science, he's been a very, very good lawyer for me. Uh, if you look over on the next side, you just push the next button, you can see that there's even, even amongst lawyers, there's only 12% that are in the science faculties. And that's a huge problem in our society today with the climate argument. Because we've got the, the scientists, uh, the lawyers, and the politicians have no idea. Most of them are arts graduates. And so when you go and talk to them about science, that's what, Ma that's what Maurice Strong knew. That's why he got the uh, weather agencies in every country involved through the WMO, because he knew they could control the politicians, that if any of the politicians asked questions, they could say, what do you know about the science? How dare you question us? So it put it in the control of the bureaucrats. Next slide. This is a study done at Yale, and it was a study on knowledge about climate change. This is the actual results. And you, they, what they did was they graded them, A, B, C, D, and F, and you, you can see that F is dominant. And here's what they did. Next, uh, if, there we go. To further adjust for the difficulty of some questions, we constructed a curving grading scale. There's that dreaded grading curve, right? All the students hate that you're gonna put the, the marks and you're gonna curve them so that the performances are, are determined by the, the grade rate. I, it was lovely for me because of course, you know, all, all uh, distributions are a bell curve. So the students would ask me, do you mark on the curve? And I would say, yes, the ball curve. <laughs> uh, next slide. Here's the results after they uh, curved the results. I mean, who decided which were the most difficult questions? If you can't answer the question, why would you curve the results? It completely negates what you're trying to do. But of course, this, and when you read how little these people knew that did this study about climate, you understand their problem. Next slide. I had to bring this forward to you. It's been in my file. Back from the days when I was started and global cooling was the threat. And um, I wondered how many of the public understood this cartoon? 
Because you see, it says either the gods are angry or there's been a 0.3% shift in the axis of rotation. It was in the New Yorker, and I never did find out how many people actually understood what this cartoon was. Next slide. Media, few journalists with science training. I found that constantly. Um, they, they, um, they go for sensationalism. Of course, that's no surprise to you. But what's happening now more and more is their own political bias, both their institutional bias and their own personal bias, has become dominant. Um, I refer to the mainstream media as the gossips in the global village. And, and the gossips, of course, are the people that can destroy a village with false information and false uh, rumor. And, um, of course, the interesting question is how different would the climate story be without the Internet? Because the Internet is the last phase of democracy because control of information has always been the control of powerful groups. And the Internet provides or virtually everybody access to all the information. They don't necessarily understand it, but it's there, it's available for them. Next slide. Um, the definition of climate change, which of course was the way that the um, uh, United Nations controlled what they were studying, and it's limited to human causes of climate change. Uh, next slide. The public believes that the IPCC are studying all causes of climate change. And, and when, when you read the quote from the IPCC, you understand why. They say, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is the leading international body for the assessment of climate change. No, it isn't. That, that's a false statement. But that's thrown at you all the time. Next slide. Uh, the political dilemma, dilemma, of course, is they, the politicians face the moral high ground of the question earlier about environment as a religion. Because in that vacuum that uh, Darwin created by getting the science using him to get rid of religion, the young people um, have a moral vacuum. And of course, environmentalism came along as a perfect uh, filler for that. And I can tell you, uh, in one of the, my science credits for art students, I made a, a deliber deliberately provocative comment. I know you can't imagine me doing that. but. I, I made a deliberately provocative comment. One of the students shouted out, I don't believe you. Well, of course, the class went rigid. He said, the, the red pencil sword of Damocles is going to descend on him. And, and I said, what don't you believe, Thomas? <laughs> no, his reply was, my name isn't Thomas. <laughs> I then had a discussion with the class about how many of them knew what that reference was. And I pointed out to them that every, every, virtually everything in the library was from a Judeo-Christian basis. And whether you agree with that or not, if you didn't understand that, you weren't going to get much out of that library. And so that's a very fundamental part of it. So the politicians, of course, are faced with the lesser of evils. Next slide. Uh, politicians use job and economy, not science, to bypass. Um, but not reject the green agenda. That's what's going on. Okay, we got, I've got a sign here to stop, but I've got two more minutes. Um, go next, next slide. Um, the U.S. Senate voted 95 to nothing against signing the uh, Kyoto uh, because it was ca caused severe economic. The next slide, I think, is the most telling one. Um, this is the Prime Minister's Council in India on climate change. He said, would rather save its people from uh, poverty than global warming. That is helping to break that uh, grip of moral high ground that the environmentalists have. That the politicians uh, and the third world countries uh, are saying, hey, we, we've got much greater priorities. And in fact, the Indian prime minister said, you're telling me that it's possible the global temperature could go up half a degree in the next hundred years. But I know that thousands or millions are going to starve. So the, the priorities have shifted with that. I love the last comment, by the way. India has determined that its per capita greenhouse gas emissions will at no point exceed that of uh, developed countries. <laughs> That's a political knife. I love that. Next slide. The, what's going on, though, is behind the scenes, the bureaucrats are controlling things. This is in British Columbia, which was the first province in Canada to bring in a carbon tax. They also introduced smart meters, which is another way of controlling people's energy use. And um, 
the person that was mainly responsible for producing this was Andrew Weaver. Um, if you push the uh, next slide. And here's what Weaver said uh, about it. And you can, I'll let you read that for yourselves. Weaver, of course, there's two things about him. One is he's suing me, as is Michael Mann. And of course, uh, it's, it's not because I'm particularly bright, it's because the public understand what I'm explaining to them. And they can't say I'm not qualified. Weaver's now a member of the Green Party in, in BC, and of course, has, has been pushing this. Um, at the uh, next slide. This, this is the EPA for um, uh, the EPA uh, is doing the same thing. In other words, there are, they are introducing climate controls and climate uh, policies through the bureaucracy. And I'll just leave you with this last quote at the bottom. Can you push the next one? Um, this is Mary McCarthy's comment, bureaucracy, the rule of no one, has become the modern form of despotism. And uh, that, that's what's going on. So I, I would suggest to you that, yes, it's, what you're doing with the science is great. What, what's been achieved through the groups like this is wonderful. But as Sonia intimated, you've really got to get to the political and to the people. And whether we like it or not, we have to acknowledge that Al Gore's movie, Inconvenient Truth, was a superb piece of propaganda. Such a good piece of propaganda that even Lena Riefenstahl would have appreciated it. Thank you.